today's episode of Plants of the Gods. Join us as we continue the discussion between ethnobotanist Dr. Mark Plotkin and Dr. Gary Nabhan. Dr. Gary Nabhan is an award-winning ethnobotanist and desert conservation biologist who explores the unique relationship between the desert landscape and its people. In the second half of a two-part episode, we'll learn more about the ceremonial use of agave plants in traditional cultures and fermented beverages in Mexico. Now, I want to go back to the origin, Gary. I mean, we're talking about your new book, Agave Spirits, but there's two books that I read which were fundamental in my career in understanding of biocultural diversity, and one of them's called The Desert Smells Like Rain, and the other one's called Gathering the Desert. These are your first two books, and they still remain my favorites. I mean, I think you owe me a commission. I've sold so many copies over the years. (laughs) <laughs> but I, I, I just want to compare them a bit because they're such wonderful books, and I want to share that with our listeners. The Desert Smells Like Rain was 1982? That's right. Book? Okay. It's a narrative and more personal style of ethnography. It tells the story about living with what were then called the Papago, the Tohono O'odham, as they're known now. It's a vivid anthropological account of their culture, their beliefs, and their practices, talks about their social structures, daily lives, and the spiritual significance of the desert. You also looked at the impact of modernization, which is a theme through both of our careers and and really something we're determined to help these people to deal with uh, on their own terms in the best ways possible. Gathering the Desert, three years later, it's a documentation of the traditional knowledge and practices, not only of the Tohono O'odham, but some of the other groups living in Sonora. And it talks about preserving and celebrating the wisdom of all these communities. Is that a fair assessment? I think that's better than I could do. <laughs> Both books share a common goal and celebrate indigenous cultures and their ecological knowledge. And to conclude... They emphasize the importance of acknowledging and respecting traditional practices in the face of cultural change. I think you're dead on. I should have had you co-author the book with me. Sometimes (laughs) when I start off a chapter, I don't know where it's going. (laughs) I was still in the womb when you wrote those 40 years ago. That's right. That's right. (laughs) So, yeah, I, I, you know... You've written over 40 books. It's kind of hard to tell people where to begin. I always tell people, well, read those first two and then read the new one. But by the time they get to it, you already have one or two more out. Well, you know, the great thing about Desert Smells Like Rain is that it was a keeper. It was sort of my right of initiation, my cutting my teeth in narrative writing. Uh, but I was inspired by Edgar Anderson and and uh, people like uh uh, Archie Carr and and uh, Rachel Carson, who saw no contradiction between trying to be a, a writer of some craft and a scientist. Uh, but the fun thing for me is when University of Arizona Press decided to do a, a new edition of Desert Smells Like Rain for the 40th anniversary of it coming out, they said, by the way, have you figured out why the desert smells like rain? And so my last two papers, and I'm on tour now, both with the Agave Spirits book, but I'm also giving talks on uh, the lexicon of fragrances in the Sonoran Desert that we once thought that the creosote bush, the most common plant in North American deserts in South America and North America, uh, was the only uh, element that uh, gave off this incredible aroma within minutes of a thunderstorm hitting the desert. And now we know that it's a, uh, an osmocosmic symphony of about 25 uh, to 40 plants in any desert habitat uh, that are all releasing these volatile oils, many of them with enormous health benefits. Um, uh, and reducing stress uh, so that people feel this enormous elation when it rains. And it's not just because it's been dry and hot, but because uh, these uh, uh, biologically active volatile compounds immediately begin to reduce our stress levels, our cortisol levels, uh, uh, our blood uh, sugar levels, our, our heartbeat, and 
and there's a psychotropic effect of this entourage or symphony of fragrances hitting us all at once. And so now we're up to about uh, 70 or 80 plants in the desert that have the same six beneficial to, to uh, mental and, and physiological health compounds that the Koreans and Japanese are promoting with their forest bathing trails in the Far East. They're working in cloud forests and, and temperate coniferous forests, uh, uh, but those same dominant chemical, chemicals, pinene, lemonene, myrcene, sabonene, are the ones that they've documented that have tangible effects. This is an aromatherapy. This is where you're getting it from a little bottle. This is being out in the environment, and within 30 seconds, you're uptaking all these chemicals that literally change every physiological, um, physiologically measurable asset of human health within 30 seconds of imbibing them. Very cool. So I want to circle back as we wind up on the role of deserts in teaching us how to manage the entire planet in the future. Like you said, it, we're living on planet desert. And after all these decades of learning from the local people and the plants and the animals and maybe even the microorganisms, what are the lessons that can be applied as you move into this era of climate change, which we're already well into, with uh, rainy seasons getting rainier and dry seasons getting drier and vice versa? Well, again, I think our the last 50 years of uh, conservation and ecological science has been rightly focused on the tropical rainforest where you and a number of your equally capable colleagues have brought that to the forefront that we all need those lungs of the uh, for the planet to uh, moderate and, and perhaps buffer ourselves from climate change. But deserts are really the laboratory of the future. We're going from, from about uh, two-fifths of uh, the uh, U.S. land surface uh, regularly hitting uh, temperatures above 100 to about three-fifths just in this de decade. And it's not just an issue of temperature, but extended drought, uh, salinization of soils, damaging solar radiation, uh, and uh, temperature thresholds for, for even desert-adapted plants like saguaro cacti, where, where, they, where their photosynthesis is really tripped up by these high temperatures. And so we need to find ways that we learn from the wisdom of the desert, to use a title of a book by uh, Thomas Merton, uh, 60 years ago, to think like a desert of how to be frugal, but not anticipate that our life will be impoverished by taking in the lessons from the desert and desert peoples, but how it will be enriched. And I think that's entirely possible. And I'm uh, working on a, a cookbook and a series of narrative essays about exploring uh, those principles of desert wisdom and culinary practices with indigenous people in deserts all around the world right now. So I think we're going to see that because food is the most direct way that we impact the environment, the trouble with the loss of agaves is not just the loss of agaves, but the loss of firewood species that go with them, that if we can learn ways of cooking that require less fossil fuel and less water, something that indigenous peoples in deserts have mastered over millennia, we'll all be better off rather than impoverished. Well, speaking of the wisdom of the desert, uh, one of the things that I've tried to do in Plants of the Gods is bring forward ethnobotanists from the past, uh, not just Schultes, Richard Spruce, Edgar Anderson. Can you talk a bit about Howard Gentry? Because I'd like his work to be known to a broader audience, especially students who are thinking of studying uh, agaves or other desert plants. Yes, Howard Gentry was kind of a grandfather of mine, uh, the same age as my own grandfather, who, who had died a few years ago. So when I started to work for him as an apprentice um, in the late 70s, when he was finishing up his magnum opus agaves of continental North America, he, he was at the end of his career 
and just a man that that had gained many lessons being the USDA plant collector in something like 24 countries and collecting over a quarter of a million uh, different seed samples on top of 180,000 plant herbarium specimens that he'd made. But what I loved about him was that he taught me how to listen to indigenous people, not superimpose my ideological or, or philosophical or cultural framework on them, but to really stop and listen and pay attention to where their interpretation of something didn't jive with mine or what I grew up with to, to um, sort of stay in that tension zone between what they were telling me and what I assumed to be true. And oftentimes, of course, they were they had a correct perception of something that I was just barely getting to know. But he he also did not see any contradiction, as most indigenous people don't either, in using something and conserving it. Uh, you know, one way we say that in the slow food movement is uh, what my friend Poppy Tooker in, in New Orleans says, honey, you got to uh, eat it if you want to save it because no one's going to grow it and put it on the marketplace if there isn't people who deeply appreciate it. And and growing up in New Orleans, you know how that's true for uh, Creole cream cheese and a lot of the, the melatones and many other vegetables and fruits around there. So Howard Gentry had worked as a farm worker, uh, hunted to keep his family fed when he was doing his uh, plant explorations in the Sierra Madre paid, uh, I think, uh, five cents a plant by Alfred Krober and Carl Sauer to bring uh, plant specimens back to the Berkeley Herbarium. And uh, when he died, those were those same plant specimens were worth a fifty dollar a specimen tax write off, uh, <laughs> uh, rather than five cents. But the the point is, he really integrated. Uh, uh, cultural studies and botanical studies in a way where he coined this term plant-human symbiosis or what he called the man-agave symbiosis, talking about the mutualistic relationships that have fascinated you and me for almost all of our careers. We're still finding new ones and they still delight us because they mean that that humans can be play a key role in the survival of plants rather than being merely a destructive force. So that's what I learned from Howard Gentry and that I've continued to learn from you since Howard died because so much of your work has had those same fundamental themes. Oh, thank you. So I want to encourage everyone to buy and read Agave Spirits, but I want to finish with a complex question, and that is the interrelationship between climate change, Mexico, Sonoran Desert toads, peyote, and mushrooms, and Carlos Castaneda. Well, thanks for throwing me a big curveball that uh, curved three different ways all at once. Let me break this down for some of your uh, readers that, and listeners that don't know that um, I live part of every year and have for the last 20 years with my wife in a Seri Indian or Concoc fishing village on the Sea of Cortez coast of the Sonoran Desert where uh, Sonoran desert codes occasionally come into their villages after very strong rains, but most of the time are invisible. They're either underground miles away or or uh, occasionally hitchhike a ride in their pickup truck. But um, in the uh, 80s, uh, an outsider uh, came in who had learned about DMT and that it was in Sonoran desert codes and uh, came into the Siri villages and Yaki villages and told them that it told leaders in those communities that their cultures had once had ceremonies about that toad, but had forgotten it, and that he was going to reintroduce those hallucinogenic uh, rituals. The Yaquis immediately threw him out, but did not throw Sonoran desert toads out. They're conserving them in ponds to grow them for looking at what low doses of DMT can do to help people with addiction. 
So all of what I'm saying is not to uh, disparage anyone who's used uh, DMT natural or synthetic, but it's that like Carlos Castaneda and like uh, the Beatles and Rolling Stones coming into the village of Maria Sabina, no indigenous culture likes to be overrun by starry-eyed uh, seekers of uh, visions that that aren't interested in all the other elements of their culture. So as one Siri woman said to me, our culture is more than just sapos. And so we jump have active there. projects. <laughs> if I uh, jump in there, the, uh, I think there's a difference between seekers of knowledge and seekers of alkaloids. <laughs> That's right. And so some of our projects funded through Amazon Conservation Team are really working on sea turtle conservation. This last week, we were out with 21 people planting uh, uh, red mangroves in places that are absolutely essential to keep ocean level rising from taking away whole villages. And so I think my bottom word is uh, 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 the Seri themselves, the Konkak traditions are involved in Sapos now. Uh, there's good practitioners, uh, uh, but there's a lot of um, charlatans out there too that people should be careful of and and trust the indigenous people themselves on what the value of that is rather than taking my word or the word of someone who's making $1,200 a person off a ceremony where they're actually singing songs about sardines rather than uh, Colorado uh, desert toads, Colorado yeah, river toads. I'm going to steal that one. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, so what's the impact of this psychedelic renaissance and conclusion on these populations of peyote and the toads and the mushrooms, or is there one? Well, mushrooms, of course, are quite resilient to uh, picking their fruiting bodies compared to peyote or, or Sonoran desert toads, both of which are declining because of climate change to begin with, but but with the toads, there's over-harvesting that's wiped out populations for, for about 100 kilometers inland from the villages in every direction. And uh, cartels want to add sapos or Colorado River toads to their portfolio of products that they, that they uh, offer to uh, uh, psychedelic-seeking uh, customers, just like uh, uh, Whiskey and vodka and and, uh, and scotch companies want to uh, add tequila or mezcal to their distribution network, and so uh, there's pressure both from the cartels and from uh, individual seekers of uh, uh, DMT from Colorado River or Sonoran Desert toads uh, to get them while they're there, and so. Uh, the Yaki are now doing conservation efforts. Uh, California National Parks and parts of Mexico are banning any collection of the toads to keep them from being wiped out. They fortunately have a big range and occur in remote areas. And I just saw some in some swimming pools in Tucson, so they're not endangered the same way that that some other plants or animals are that we worry about. But uh, over depletion. Uh, has happened uh, to things like passenger pigeons that were once abundant and wiped them out. So we have to be real careful about this and respectful, not just of the indigenous traditions, but of the, the biological force that guides them, which is in this case, a, a very humble uh, little toad that uh, is above ground only for about three weeks each year. Okay, so to conclude, can you give us a summary and update on your work with the series and the sea turtles, emphasizing how you went down there to look at the plants and found that these people have a rich and detailed knowledge of these marine organisms that people just didn't realize until people like you and, and Lori Monty started asking and studying? Yeah, after you and I worked on ironwood conservation uh, to protect a tree that's sort of the keystone species on land, this very pointed out to me that the eelgrass uh, 
beds where sea turtles uh, overwinter are sort of a keystone habitat in the marine environment. And one Sari leader said to me after we successfully had stopped the overharvesting of ironwood and the destructions of the coastal forest, you conservationists are really good at stopping things. But what can you do to, to guarantee that our livelihoods um, can keep our families fed because we lost about 250 jobs in the community uh, when the ironwood was depleted? We don't want sea turtle conservation to happen and there be no options for work. And that's where we came up with the Perry Ecology Program that continues in one form or another to this day. And right now the emphasis is on protecting and restoring damaged parts of both eel grass and mangroves because sea turtles need them both. Amazon conservation team support is helping with protecting nesting beaches and hatchlings of two sea turtle species of the five that reach the Gulf of California. And it's been incredibly successful. Thousands of hatchlings released and as you and I shared in Costa Rica, that feeling of having a hatchling sea turtle in your hand and that you're releasing it back into the ocean is probably one of the trippiest feelings you or I have ever felt. And so I just think the positive energy of the Siri people to conserving their homelands and home waters and the sacred creatures in them is an example to the world. And Thankfully, Erica Barnett, uh, the co-manager of the Amazon Conservation uh, Team project with, with uh, all of this, just won a uh, National Women in Conservation Award in Mexico City. So they're getting national recognition. Uh, they're part of the Ancestral Tides program that Amazon Conservation Team is working on. And we're seeing all these pieces come together and creating livelihoods for 70 to 80 people in the village. It's the third largest income source in those Seri villages now. That's great. Well, Dr. Gary Paul Nabhan, this has been great. I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but I don't want to take too much of your time. So um, I think it was plenty of food for thought about food and other things. So I want to uh, give you a standing invite to come back and continue the conversation. But I think we got a lot of feast on for today. And I just want to thank you and, of course, your co-founder, Liliana, and your board and your remarkable staff that are bringing in new tools and, and ways of looking at things that have deeply enhanced uh, what you all started well over 30 years ago and you're still working in some of those same communities and branching out to others and to most ethnobiologists that i know you you have your hands on uh, uh, the wheel of a ship that's guiding all of us to safer ground so thank you well i'd be remiss if i didn't point out that you were one of our co-founders so thank you that's well i i never thought of it that way but uh I, I would I would edit your sentence and say I was probably a confounder. As, <laughs> as I said, we will continue this conversation. And your co-co-founder, Lori Monty, who we hope to have on in a future episode as well. So. And she's back at home uh, uh, archiving series songs about uh, wild creatures. So she gives you her love too. Thank you. Take care. Take care. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to check out other episodes from ayahuasca to magic mushrooms, from the ethnobotany of warfare to the history and prehistory of wine. Please give us a top rating and subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team. In our next episode, Join host Dr. Mark Plotkin in conversation with colleague Dr. Bruce Hoffman, Senior Manager of Scientific Research at ACT, as we learn about the ethnobotany of Amazonian lianas.